I would like to welcome everyone today to our Justice Lecture in the Great Ideas series. It just so happens that today's Justice Lecture falls on September 17th, which is a recognized holiday, of course not the kind of holiday we get out of school for, um, in the United States because it is the day commemorating the signing of the United States Constitution. So we call it Constitution Day. Um, the federal government actually requires that we have some form of educational programming on this state, but we would do it anyway. Um, today's lecture will be given by Dr. Peter Irons. Dr. Irons earned a BA in Sociology and Anthropology from Antioch College. He earned a Master's and Doctorate in Political Science from Boston University. And he also earned a JD from Harvard Law School. Those are his credentials, which of course are very impressive. But what is most impressive about Dr. Irons is his commitment to social justice and to civil rights. Dr. Irons actually spent time in federal prison uh, because of his stance against the government on racial discrimination. He helped defend Daniel Ellsberg, who had stolen the Pentagon Papers. He established the Earl Warren Bill of Rights Project at the University of California at San Diego and represented Japanese Americans, including Fred Korematsu, um, who had refused the federal government's order to report to internment camps, and he represented them in their efforts to have their convictions overturned. Dr. Irons had a long and distinguished teaching career before he retired in 2004. During his career, he published numerous award-winning books, and his books focus on the stories of individuals who brought cases to the United States Supreme Court. He has been praised by Bill Moyers, among others, who wrote that his book, The Courage of Their Convictions, gives the reader the sense of the actual person behind the name. One more reminder that the Bill of Rights indeed is for the people. This morning, Dr. Irons will kick off our year-long commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act. He has entitled his lecture, Justice at the Ballot Box, Voting Rights and the Struggles for Full Citizenship. Please help me welcome Dr. Peter Irons. I want to start out by asking a question and having you raise your hands. How many of you are now 18 years old? Virtually everybody. It's a little hard for me to see all the way around. How many of you who are 18 are registered to vote? That's a good proportion. How many of you plan to vote in the next election? That's really good too. Because the ability to cast a ballot and make your voice heard and participate in our society in making decisions that are going to affect all of us is really an, a, 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 an essential part of citizenship. In fact, it is the essential part of citizenship. Because without that, you would be at the mercy of those who make decisions for you without your participation. Now, I want to start out by telling you that this lecture really should not have been necessary. I'm talking about <clears throat> the Voting Rights Act of 1965, enacted 50 years ago by Congress. But almost 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago, in 1870, Congress enacted and the states ratified an amendment to the Constitution that should have made the Voting Rights Act unnecessary. Now, I'm sure that you all, I hope, got some education before you got here, and will get some while you're here, in our Constitution, our system of law, the role of the courts in interpreting that law. But if we go back 
1787, September 17th, when the delegates to the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, after four months of sitting in a sweltering hot building, Independence Hall, hammering out a constitution for the 13 colonies that had been governed since independence from Britain by a patchwork called the Articles of Confederation, which did not work. There was no central government. Every state had a veto over the laws passed by Congress, and that simply wasn't working. One state, in fact, Rhode Island, simply refused to participate in the Constitutional Convention. But they sat there and drafted a document. And that document, which we now revere, many people think it is divinely inspired, that document contained provisions which denied a quarter of the people, in fact, more than half of the people, if you think about women, any participation at all in that government. And these were the people, of course, who came over beginning even before the Mayflower in 1619, when the first slaves arrived in Virginia, a year before the Mayflower. They had no rights at all. They were property. And the Constitution that was drafted recognized their role as property, not as human beings. The Constitution was a compromise because there were states divided between slave-owning states in the South and the Northern states in which slavery, incidentally, for most of the northern states, was legal, but not widespread, because slaves were used mainly for agricultural labor on the plantations. And that constitution contained provisions, for example, the three-fifths clause, in apportioning seats in the House of Representatives. The southern delegates insisted on counting their slaves, even though they couldn't vote. And the Northerners thought that was unfair. So they enacted a compromise in which an African person was considered only three-fifths of a person, the three-fifths clause of the Constitution. Another clause allowed the Southern states to continue importing slaves from Africa for another 20 years. And a third provision made it mandatory for the northern states to return to their owners any slaves who had the temerity to escape from bondage and seek freedom in the north, the Fugitive Slave Clause. So the Constitution itself was a slavery document. And we tend not to remember that because it's ancient history and it's embarrassing but it was the reality of that time. And then, of course, as you know, we had a great civil war. A civil war that was started by the demand of southern states to retain their property in slaves. And anyone who tells you that the civil war was only about states' rights, what right were they talking about? The right to own slaves. And so we had a great civil war. Fortunately, not many of the battles were fought here in East Tennessee. This was Union territory. Jefferson County voted 95% against secession from the Union to its credit. But the southern states fought a war against the Union in which 600,000 people were killed. We tend to forget the magnitude of that bloodshed. And at the end of that war, with the Union victorious, 
there was an attempt to abolish the terrible institution. Congress enacted and the states ratified the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery. And then the 14th Amendment, which gave them citizenship that the, that the Supreme Court had taken away in the Dred Scott case, saying that blacks have no rights which the white man must respect. And the 14th Amendment says, all persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens thereof. And then, the 15th Amendment. Now, I'm going to read you the text of the 15th Amendment. And as I said, the 15th Amendment should have made this lecture unnecessary. We have better things to do this morning. The 15th Amendment says, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude, which means slavery. So it says very clearly, neither the federal government nor any state can deny or abridge the right to vote. So what happened? The southern states flatly abridged the rights to vote of the newly freed slaves in a number of ways. They passed laws that were designed to make it difficult, if not impossible, for the freedmen to vote. Poll taxes. Well, these were all poor people. To pay a tax in order to vote. If you go in to vote next November and somebody says, give me $10 before you can cast your ballot, that would be unlawful. But poll taxes were instituted. Literacy tests. Now, it was a crime in most states, in the southern states. It was a crime before the Civil War to teach a slave to read or write. A few did, but very, very few. So they were illiterate. The government did set up schools, freedmen's schools, but literacy was still minimal. So literacy tests were imposed. If you couldn't read or write, you couldn't vote. And then they had, because there were a lot of poor white people who couldn't read or write either. This was long before universal public education. Now how to get around that? Because they wanted them to vote. They had what were called grandfather clauses which meant that if your grandfather could have voted, you can vote. Well, the grandfathers of slaves could not vote. Never could. So that enfranchised the poor whites, but kept the former slaves from voting. And then they had what were called whites' own whites only primaries. The political parties and the dominant political party in the South was the Democratic Party. Set up their own primaries and only whites could vote in the primaries so you couldn't influence the candidates for office. And these were all strategies designed to keep African Americans from participating in their own society. So things during the period of Jim Crow that followed slavery, and Jim Crow lasted until very recently, legalized Jim Crow. Other forms of Jim Crow still exist, by the way. But legalized Jim Crow lasted well beyond 
the Supreme Court decision in Brown versus Board of Education. It took 20 years after Brown for the Supreme Court to strike down poll taxes, literacy tests. So Congress enacted the Voting Rights Act. Now, what I'd like to do, as Dr. Stuthberry said, um, I've studied and written about and taught about the Supreme Court and the Constitution for my entire career. And it's a document that I think is not perfect. It's been amended 27 times. In fact, it wasn't until 95 years ago. Well, let me just ask a question of the women today. 95 years ago, could you have, if you were <laughs> alive back then, could you have voted? No. Why not? Why not? I mean, if, here's a woman sitting next to a gentleman right here in this row, right? Why could you vote and not she? There's no good reason. <laughs> and the Supreme Court had held back in the 1870s that women were too modest to vote. I don't know why. But at any rate, so these Jim Crow practices persisted. And during the 1950s and 1960s, when I was growing up and getting involved in social justice struggles, the civil rights movement, the sit-ins, uh, having grown up in the North, but having lived for some time in the South, and realizing the total injustice of racial segregation. And I was fortunate to be raised in a family in the upper middle class white suburb we lived in in Cincinnati, Ohio, a very conservative city back then, Fortunate to be raised in a family which did not join the popular culture of polite, genteel racism. The people I went to high school with, decent people, most of them, <laughs> looked down upon African Americans. They really did. In 1957, when I was a junior in high school, there were riots in Little Rock, Arkansas. A federal court had ordered the integration of Central High School. And eight black students were admitted. But they couldn't go to the school because the governor, Orville Faubus, called out the National Guard to keep them out of the school. And there were howling mobs on the streets, screaming, spitting, throwing things threatening them. And it took President Eisenhower calling out the 101st Airborne Division to quell those riots. And the National Guard backed down. And the students went into the school, but they endured taunts, humiliation for the entire year. And it was at that time when my friends would go around town, drive around in their cars with the windows down, yelling out, Faubus for president. Why did they do that? They weren't Klansmen. They didn't burn crosses. They didn't wear white robes. But they had absorbed a culture, grown up in a culture, had not freed themselves from a culture that was, at its core, racist. And I was fortunate, as I said, to be inoculated against that virus by my family and my church. I grew up as a Unitarian, a church that was founded on 
principles of tolerance and dignity of all people. And I'm proud that I did. In fact, I thought seriously of becoming a minister, and some of my students over the years have said, you know, you preach more than you teach. <laughs> Probably true. But at any rate, I want to spend most of the rest of our time talking about some real people. And these are people you probably, of course you've never met them, because they're dead. They were murdered here in the United States simply because they wanted and demanded the right to vote. And I'm going to read you a list of martyrs. Now, every religion has martyrs. The Christian religion has its share of martyrs. Islam, Judaism. And martyrs are people who die for their faith. And these are people who died for their faith injustice and equality. And I'm going to read you a list of names. Now, last night when I spoke, I asked people to raise their hands if they'd heard these people, heard of these people, but it's hard for me with these lights to see <laughs> your hands, so I'm just going to read them to you. You may recognize one or two, but probably not all. Herbert Lee, Leo McKnight, Medgar Evers, I'm going to add, I can see some of you. Raise your hands if you've heard of Medgar Evers. Well, you should have. Thank you very much. Michael Schwerner, Andrew Goodman, James Cheney, Addie Mae Collins, Cynthia Wesley, Carol Robertson, Denise McNair, Lewis Allen. Reverend James Reeb, Viola Liuzzo, and Vernon Dahmer. Now these are 14 people who were murdered because they believed in equality and the right to vote. And they were murdered not far from here, many of them in a state adjoining Tennessee, the state of Mississippi, the bastion of Jim Crow and the Klan. And these were people who were murdered by the Klan. An organization founded, not that I'm picking on your state, in Tennessee in 1865, the town of Pulaski. And let me tell you a little bit about these people, because they're ordinary people. They're not famous civil rights activists like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. They're just ordinary people trying to live a life, earn a living, support their families. And I'll tell you just a little bit about each one. I wish I could say more. Herbert Lee lived in Amit County in Mississippi. He was a farmer, a fairly successful farmer. He belonged to the NAACP. He'd been a veteran of World War II. Like many of the civil rights activists in the South, they came back from the war believing, having fought for democracy, that they should enjoy democracy but they did not. Herbert Lee had nine children. He went down to register to vote twice and was turned away. And his effort to organize other African Americans in his county to vote got him in trouble with a white man named E.H. Hurst, a state senator in Mississippi. So one day, 
Hearst followed Herbert Lee to the cotton gin where Lee was going to sell his cotton, got out of his truck, came over to Lee's truck, pulled out a pistol, and shot him in the head and killed him. Murdered him. Now what's the penalty for murder in Mississippi? Back then, the death penalty. What happened to E.H. Hurst? Nothing. Nothing at all. He never served a day in jail. There were 11 witnesses to the murder. He was never prosecuted. Leo McKnight, who witnessed Herbert Lee's murder, was himself murdered. Now he testified, they had a coroner's inquest a few hours after Herbert Lee was murdered, at which the witnesses testified, and Leo McKnight testified that Herbert Lee was actually holding a tire iron, tire iron in his hand so that Hearst shot him in self-defense. That was not true. So why did Herbert, why did Leo McKnight say this? Well, his widow later said he lied because he wanted to live for his family. He was afraid they would kill him if he didn't say that Mr. Lee had a piece of iron because Negroes don't have no say-so. So what happened to Leo McKnight? His pregnant wife? his daughter, his son-in-law. They were murdered by the sheriff, Danny Jones. Was he prosecuted when they put a sheriff on trial for murder in Mississippi? No. And then Medgar Evers, who's probably the best known victim of the voting rights struggle, he was a World War II vet, was in the Normandy invasion. He came back from the war and said, we fought during the war for America, Mississippi included. Now, after the Germans and the Japanese hadn't killed us, it looked though as if the white people in Mississippi would, and they did. He became the field secretary for the NAACP in Mississippi graduated from, <clears throat> excuse me, graduated from Alcorn State College, <clears throat> applied to the University of Mississippi Law School, and was rejected because he failed the skin test. He was black. Hours after President John Kennedy delivered a nationally televised speech, I remember watching that speech in 1963, calling on Congress to pass a Civil Rights Act. Medgar Evers drove home, lived in Jackson, got out of his car, he was carrying a box that had t-shirts that said, Jim Crow must go, and was shot in the back and killed. His assassin, a Klan member, Byron De La Beckwith, was, acquit was acquitted by an all-white jury. Why were the juries all white? Because they were drawn from the voter rolls and blacks couldn't vote. That was a time to speak personally for a moment. I was involved in the civil rights movement, was in the sit-ins, worked in Washington, D.C. for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, whose chairman at the time, John Lewis, gave a powerful, powerful speech at the Lincoln Memorial in August 1963. We all know who else spoke I was at the 
foot of the steps to the memorial for that march on Washington at which Dr. King said, I have a dream that one day my four children will be judged not by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. But John Lewis gave, I think, an even more powerful speech. He had been beaten 30 times and jailed across the South. He is now a member of Congress from Georgia. And there were songs written about Medgar Evers. I want to read you the lyrics of two of them because one of these songs was sung from the Lincoln Memorial at the March on Washington by Bob Dylan. And you may, I asked people last night, had they heard of Bob Dylan? A lot of them had not one of the great folk singers of our time. But anyway, a song said, in the state of Mississippi, many years ago, a boy of 14 years got a taste of Southern law. He saw his friend a hanging, being lynched. His color was his crime. The blood upon his jacket put a brand upon his mind. His name was Medgar Evers, and he walked his road alone, like Emmett Till and thousands more whose names we'll never know. They tried to burn his home, and they beat him to the ground, but deep inside they both knew what it took to bring him down. The killer waited by his home, hidden by the night, as Evers stepped out from his car into the rifle sight. He slowly squeezed the trigger. The bullet left his side. It struck the, man, the heart of every man when Evers fell and died. They laid him in his grave while the bugle sounded clear. They laid him in his grave while victory was near. While we waited for the future, for freedom through the land, the country gained a killer, and the country lost a man. Too many martyrs, too many dead, too many lies, too many empty words were said, too many times for too many angry men. Oh, let it never be again. And there are more. And I realize from the clock on the down there that I can't tell you the full stories of the rest of these people, but I'll tell you a few. Mickey Schwerner, Andy Goodman, James Cheney, civil rights workers in Mississippi. Mickey and Andy were northerners, northern Jewish agitators, they called them. I knew both of them before they died, and Jim Cheney was just a local guy young man, 19 years old, helping them register voters. In Philadelphia, Mississippi, Neshoba County, the sheriff, Lawrence Rainey, arrested them one night, pulled over their car on a trumped up charge, put them in jail, and went out to organize their murder let them out of jail, told them to go away, followed them into a deserted area, stopped their car, pulled them out, beat them, shot them, dumped their bodies in a dam, covered them up with a bulldozer. It took 44 days to find their bodies. What happened to their killers? Sheriff Rainey and the other Klansmen, because most of the sheriffs in that area were Klansmen. Nothing. And then four little girls 
Hattie Mae, Denise, Carol, and Cynthia. 11 years old. We're in a Baptist church. It should be a safe place. They call this a sanctuary. What does a sanctuary mean? It's a safe place. You take sanctuary to be safe. The 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, 1963. These four little girls were getting ready, putting on their best Sunday clothes for a performance in the church. But earlier that morning, in the middle of the night, four Klansmen put 15 sticks of dynamite under the church steps. And when these little girls were coming down the steps, they were blown to bits and murdered. There had been 21 bombings in Birmingham that year. They called the city Bombingham. Martin Luther King called it the most thoroughly segregated city in the United States. What happened? There were no prosecutions. Everybody knew who the Klansmen were. They even boasted about it. Fortunately, if you're being optimistic, in 1977, the federal government prodded the state into prosecuting the well-known perpetrators of these murders. Three of them were convicted of murder. One of them fled to Mississippi and never came back. Now, I could go on more about Lewis Allen, about the Reverend James Reeb, a Unitarian minister from Boston who came down for the march from Selma to Montgomery, the Voting Rights March. They recently made a movie about it. Reverend Reeb was beaten to death by Klansmen. Four men were indicted. They were acquitted by an all-white jury. And at the end of the trial, the killers participated in a Klan rally and were cheered. Now, I want to conclude by telling you about some of my heroes, people you probably have not heard of, because heroes are not all famous. In fact, most heroes and heroines are ordinary people who do extraordinary things because of their convictions, their beliefs, their values. Every one of us is a product of our time and our place and our culture. This is your time. This is your place. This is your culture. And the values that are shaped by your time and your place and your culture are what animate your life. And I'll tell you about two of my heroes and then conclude. I wish I could stay around all morning and talk with you, get to know you. Mother Mary Harris Jones. Has anyone heard of Mother Jones? Mother Jones was a very small woman lived to be a hundred years old and she spent her life her husband had been a coal miner in Pennsylvania died in the mines and she devoted the rest of her life to organizing workers 
and helping workers when they went on strike and their families. She used to say, wherever the workers are fighting the bosses, that's where I live. And Mother Jones had a motto, which she repeated everywhere she spoke. This was back in the early 20th century. And her motto was this, pray for the dead and fight like hell for the living. We do pray for the dead. The people I told you about murdered for their beliefs. Pray for them. But fight like hell for the living. Each in your own way. Every one of us has the capacity to make a change, to make a difference in the lives of the people we live with, because we live with each other. Not only here, we live in a global society. There are people all over the world who need our help. Refugees trying to find a life outside of Syria in Iraq. Refugees in Africa. Poor people. The poor we will always have with us. That's sad to think, but true. So, Mother Jones, a tiny, frail woman, had an indomitable spirit. My other hero, and I'll finish with him, Horace Mann. Does anybody recognize Horace Mann? There we have one or two. Horace Mann was the father of American public education. If you went to a public school, thank Horace Mann. He founded the first system of public schools in Massachusetts. Then he became a member of Congress, running as an abolitionist in the 1840s. But he went to Congress and he got frustrated because the Southerners who dominated Congress had passed a rule, it's called the gag rule. No member of Congress could introduce a resolution or a bill or even speak on the floor about slavery. It's like cutting his tongue out. But the Southerners dominated Congress back then, the slave owners. And so Horace Mann resigned from Congress and became president of Antioch College. 57 years ago, I entered Antioch College as a freshman. It's in central Ohio, in the middle of cornfields, but it was an oasis, a stop on the Underground Railroad, where escaping slaves from Kentucky and other states were helped, hidden, and helped to escape further north, many of them into Canada. And Horace Mann became the first president of Antioch College, and he gave an, a commencement address to the graduates in 1859, just a couple of weeks before he died. And when I first arrived, my first day at Antioch, a very beautiful campus just like yours, there was a monolith in front of the main building about 15 feet tall, granite monolith. And inscribed on the base of the monolith were the words that Horace Mann spoke to the graduates, sending them out to lead lives of service. And this is what he said. Be ashamed to die until you have won some victory for humanity. Be ashamed to die until you have won some victory for humanity. No matter how small, no matter where, some small victory. And you can do that. And I believe that you will. Thank you very much.